Hey everybody, it's Leslie Rohde with Martha's Brain Trust, and here today, another hangout on Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm joined today by the black and white uh, Dan Thies and the other colorful Michelle, Michelle Chance Sang Um We had a little bit of problems uh, getting started, so we probably, probably, if you were on just a moment ago, you probably got booted out and have to get back in again. But of course, if you're booted out, you can't hear me tell you that. So that was kind of moot. We're up to uh, six now, eight now. Hey, people are yeah. making it back in. Good. Yeah, so, yeah. A little, little snafu with sound, as usual. All right. Um, so, cool. Let's uh, let everybody, well, give everybody a couple of minutes to get back in, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as always, let's see. Write your message here. Ask your, thank you, someone. Ask your question below. Whatever. Oh, You're so welcome. Very good. Um, I really like that yellow and purple you got going on there, Michelle. That's, Thank you. That's very colorful. That's Thank you. Mean, only girls know how to combine colors like that. Well, well I, also I, know I think purple. I think the Vikings and the Lakers know how to do this. I think also. Fair enough. Um, but Dan doesn't know how to do color at all. Apparently. I've got purple and gray. Um, sure you do. Okay, so it looks like people are now getting back into the Hangout, so let's go ahead and get it started, as we say. Let's I'm get gonna, this party going. Yeah, let me present myself to everybody, uh, so to speak. And then... Um, you can get arrested in some cities for doing that, Leslie. And, and probably should, actually. Um, and then let's see, I have to do the uh, share screen thing. Atlanta is probably one of those cities where they're a little more lenient about those things, but probably. Uh, let's see, entire screen. Jumping into the Hall of Mirrors, and then of course it consumes so much resources painting the Hall of Mirrors. It takes forever to actually get over to my slides, but okay. And now let's see if this actually plays from start like it didn't do last week yet. Last uh, last week. Um, I'm seeing the black screen. I'm not sure which piece of software oh, before sure. the blame here. Well, it has to turn black before it can show your slide, right? I think it's just slow. Maybe it died again. Wow. <laughs> it's like, okay, two weeks in a row, it'll play from start, and... It won't play during a hangout. I don't know. Hang on just a second while we um, while we oh, fix that. All of the little crash dialogues throughout the whole Hall of Mirrors. I know, right? And so let me see if I can just um, print the PDF and do it that way like we did last week. Are you seeing my Hall of Mirrors, or is that... You just went to... Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, never mind. Hang on, let me, let me stop presenting here. This is nuts. I can't. Come on. Come on. Oh, my heavens. Stop presenting. Thank you. Good grief. Stop. Thank you. One moment, guys. I'll print this in the PDF so we have something that actually works. That's pretty ridiculous. I guess I should have just believed. I saved this PDF to start with. Then. <sighs> Tell you what, this sucker consumes huge amounts of resources when it's broadcasting. Get rid of PowerPoint. It would actually be the right thing to do is to get rid of PowerPoint. All right, let's try this. Let's try this ridiculous thing again. 
listening to everyone. The entire screen. <laughs> on the camera. On the presentation deck. Wow, okay. Bing. How was that? Yeah. Well, how was that on the timer? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a whole lot of a lot of computer doing a whole bunch of nothing. So, all right. So, the subject of today is: Is content marketing right for your business? And I'll, you know, paid political ad uh, for most business. I'll tell you the punchline is: For most businesses, the answer is yes. However, there will be some notable exceptions. So, let's go through the, you know, from the ground up: Why content marketing is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, how it works, why it works, and what you would use it for, and what kind of business. So first, let's define what content marketing means, and this is from the Content Marketing Institute. Yes, there's actually an institute for that. And this is content marketing is a marketing business process for creating and distributing relevant and valuable content to attract, acquire, and engage a clearly defined and understood target audience, and of course, that's with the objective of driving profitable customer action. Now that's ultimately not right away, and so there are some things which are distinct from content marketing we'll talk about in just a moment that ultimately have to do with the objective of driving profitable customer action, but do not lie in that realm of content marketing. So what is content? Well, first of all, you can go really big and you can create your own feature-length movie to sell toys. Yes, Lego movie was in fact content marketing at its finest, or at least biggest. <laughs> A free ebook that you make available on your website is also content, content marketing, and that's one of the things that we do. YouTube videos, even OG hangouts and webinars, a blog post, that's that's content. But you notice from the top down, we're getting smaller and smaller. Tech meme, which is really kind of tied for Twitter in terms of the size of the, the size of the pieces of content, you know, any particular if you go to tech meme, you'll find that any any particular post is really, God, I guess maybe 15 words would be about right. It would actually spit in the tweet, um, and then it's got a title which is always larger than the than the content itself, and it's got a gazillion tags, you know, the character to classify what uh, what its subject is. Uh, it, Tech meme does quite well, and it's you know a classic uh, you know, kind of curated stream of content on the same size you know as tweets. All of these constitute content in a real sense. Now, what is not content? And bear in mind that not everything in you know in this group would necessarily be be content. Like you could have a tweet that just says "Go buy my stuff" with a link, and that's not really content marketing. That's more in the realm of things which are not content. A product page on a cart, you know, in a, in a, in a shopping cart, or a, a, a sales letter, a long form sales letter with a big orange buy now button. Those are not really content, not in the sense that content marketing is being used. It's content from an SEO perspective, it gets indexed, but it's not content from a marketing perspective. And then there's those things that are kind of a little bit of both happening at the same time, as Forrest Gump's mom would say. Uh, infomercials are kind of an age old example, They're used in, in uh, TV media. Uh, launch videos are kind of our online equivalent of that, and of course, gee, webinars and hangouts are uh, in that category as well, where there's got to be some sort of commercial intent of doing them at all. Uh, it's just that that's not the, the primary body of, of the work. Launch videos, you'll find that you know of the three of the four videos in a standard Walker style launch, three of those are focused almost entirely on teaching, on content, on so-called results in advance. It's only the fourth video in that sequence, which is a straight-up video sales letter. Infomercials, they take the same kind of pattern, a little, little bit different, a um, little bit different execution, you know, but it's uh, primarily focused on some, uh, uh, some content, some teaching, with uh, obviously the, the, um, the sales message wrapped into it. You have, <clears throat> I should have listed this one, too. You also have what's called product placement. So, you know, uh, oh, um, you know, Trump's show, um, what's it called? Um, you know what I mean? You're fired. That where you know in, in later seasons at least they really kind of nailed it. Where the uh, the missions that were given to these these four suckers uh, were created by uh, companies like you know Coke and others, and so that I mean the product 
was woven in with the story itself. There was no way to actually listen to the story without also getting the product, you know, beat over your head. And that's really that's content marketing with obviously a you know pretty uh, heavy-handed uh, uh, placement of the product. Lego Movie, the same thing. You know, how can Lego Movie? How you do not know? Well, first of all, the name of it tells you what it's about, and you're seeing the product, you know, the whole time. Uh, so now, where does content marketing fit in the you know the totality of marketing and sales? Well, first of all, it's all what we call top of funnel. That is to say, it's the early portion of the process. And there was a, an interesting study by um, an outfit named Serious Decisions. I can't remember your name. Uh, that said that 70% of the buyer journey actually occurs outside of the sales process per se. Now, I uh, I need to go dig into exactly what sorts of companies and, and uh, Business models that they would be you know, really treated, what kind of markets are being treated there, but we're digging that in any detail. But certainly, it's the case that the one and done, you know, person finds your pay per click ad, they click it and they buy. That's not the majority of the way your sales are made online. If there's multiple touches involved where the person is doing informational searches and then followed by more commercial queries, and then finally the so called wallet out query that results in a transaction. The stuff before he pulls his he or she pulls his wallet out, you know, that's that's mid funnel, top of funnel, right? It's earlier in the buyer's journey. That's where content marketing fits, and what it succeeds, you know, in doing is is improving your branding and communicating your branding and and your positioning. It tells how you are different than the competition. It also, when you do it right, it establishes trust because now you're seen as a thought leader, an expert in the field, providing good content value in advance. It's also an opportunity for you to educate and indoctrinate your market. Now, those are kind of a little bit of the same thing happening there, but education, you know, just the facts, man. Indoctrination is where you steer their thinking, and you can actually embed what the important buying criteria are early on. And we've all seen these. It's like um, you'll download a buyer's guide that says, the, you know, the five things you should do before hiring an SEO company. You know, and we've never actually written one of those, but you can find lots of those. If you just Google that, I'm sure you find you know, hundreds of results without exact title. And they're always written by, wow, big surprise, SEO company. But what they're doing is they're steering the conversation. They're indoctrinating you with what the, the criteria ought to be. So, for example, if I'm a long-established SEO company, then one of the five things is make sure they have long experience in the market. And if I'm a new upstart, I'm going to have you know, in my version of that document, instead of long experience in the market, make sure they're on the leading edge and of the most up-to-date information. You see? And you know? by the way, Leslie, I mean, that template uh, is something that almost any kind of a long sale uh, kind of business, whether you're selling you know, industrial air conditioning systems or uh, facilities management or whatever, changing the conversation and defining the buyer's requirements before you actually have them as a prospect is one of the most effective ways to uh, leverage the sales force that you have. Absolutely is. And it's a, it's a reason that those kinds of, and B2B, which, you know, high-end B2B stuff where you're talking about, you know, I, you know, big IT purchases and stuff like that, they've done white papers like that for, like, since there was paper. Right. And that's yeah. why. Yeah. The cool thing about it now is that you don't just have to do that all in one shot with a big white paper that you ship to people. You can actually do that one idea at a time through right. content marketing. Yep. Yep. Sequences of blog posts, sequences of email items, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Sequences of messaging. Um, and that kind of drives, and that, that kind of gets into nurturing. And so once you actually have a contact with a, with a person, once you have that initial initial touch point where they have provided in exchange for some value, like a download or something like that, where they have you know, provided you an opportunity to get back to them, now you have the opportunity to nurture them. And uh, that's, that's really key. If you can get a person out of the quote unquote normal channels into email, uh, that's a fantastic place for them to be. Although you can also nowadays use custom audiences to um, treat right. people just like they opted into an email sequence. It's just that if they haven't, that's one channel they're not going to receive that message in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can yeah, make sure that you appear on their wall. Uh, yeah. So uh, now, what what are the business results achieved, uh, you know, achievable with content marketing? Well, so, so so first of all, I mean, we're going to cover these individually. But assisted conversion, increased traffic, and reduced conversion costs. Now, those those last two are probably uh, everybody understands what those mean. But let's talk about the first one first. 
So first of all, what does assisted conversion mean? Well, that, that means that the conversion is assisted by content. Wow, okay, brilliant. And so what does that mean? Like why, how would you assist in getting the person to convert? Well, that goes back to the argument that one and done is the rarity. But the reality is that you need to have a uh, multiple touches with that person. In general, you have to have multiple touches with a prospect before you can sell them. And the way you do that is to provide some sort of value in advance so that they become, they get, they get to know you, like you, and trust you. This also, as we were just talking about, gives you the opportunity to indoctrinate them into your way of thinking. And bear in mind that the more touches you get, it ends up in a higher conversion rate. That's what assisted conversion is about. So let's say for a moment that all you had was average running, and literally you had like a one-page website. Okay? So clearly content marketing is not what you're doing. Well, how many, how many times could they touch you before converting? Well, I mean, they could go bang after your PPC ad a whole bunch of times. Um, that would be really brilliant, wouldn't it? Uh, but they wouldn't, have a, they wouldn't have a need or desire to because you only have one page. Um, so they're either going to hit that page and they're going to buy and maybe they bookmark you and come back, or maybe they don't. Maybe they remember your name, and they, they type the name in, and then, of course, they still hit your PPC ad. Right? So you're relying entirely on just that one channel, AdWords, in order to, in order to convert that sale. Now, let's say for, for a moment that you have a whole bunch of free content for them to engage with before you know, they have to decide. Well, now suddenly, let's say they discover your, your one page, but now it says, you know, in the upper right-hand corner, it says blog, and they go read a whole bunch of your stuff, and then they come back and they buy. See, the, the, that content assisted in converting that person because it allowed you to indoctrinate, educate and indoctrinate them. They got to know you a little bit, and if your stuff was good, if it was on point, if it spoke to them the way they wanted to be spoken to, then they trust you too. And so that's, that's what we mean by assisted conversion. You can see that in reports in Google Analytics, the extent to which uh, multiple channels uh, provide you know, a synergistic uh, you know, assistance. So the next thing, of course, is increased traffic. What you want to do with content, not just create content. If you just create content, what you're doing is relying on one single channel called search. And in case you missed the memo, search is actually in decline. You know, total desktop searches is, has peaked whenever the hell it peaked and is now in decline. So if all you do is publish content, you rely on Google to index it, okay, well, bully for you, but you're working a losing proposition. And at this point, uh, I believe it is 25% uh, of, of all traffic is Facebook traffic or some ridiculous number like that. It's, it's basically second only to YouTube. Um, so go meet your prospects where they are. Where are they? They're everywhere. Now, you know, more of them are on Facebook than anywhere else. 72% of the adult population in the United States is on Facebook, or at least has an account. I mean, I'm one of that 72%. Wait, am I an adult? Maybe. And so, uh, but I'm not ever there. Okay, so fine, I'm an exception. Maybe. But you know what? We're few and far between. And besides, even I occasionally show up on Facebook. You know, I open up my iPad. My iPad tells me what happened on my Facebook wall. And occasionally I go there and look. And then guess what? Just like everyone else, I get sucked into Facebook, a gravitational black hole. Okay? Well, they're pretty good at that. I mean, I, you know, it's bizarre, really. Anyway, so be everywhere. That means Twitter. It means Facebook. It means everywhere. Even, oh, God forbid, Google+. Plus. Okay? And also realize that repeat visits are the best visits. Why? <laughs> because the average customer visits you more than once before they become a customer. So if you're looking for a leading indicator of sale, okay, well, let's see. So sale, that'd be good. But wait, let's see. Entering the shopping cart, that would be a leading indicator. Oh, visiting the website, that'd be, oh, visiting the website more than once, right? Repeat visits are the best kind of visits. Then finally, reducing your conversion cost. By now, you should see how this works. If you're doing paid traffic at all, incorporating non-paid into the equation will reduce your total cost of conversion. As it stands, in your first example, you have a one-page website and only AdWords. The only place, the only way, the only traffic source is going to click your AdWords ad over and over and over again. Wow, that's efficient, right? Instead, let's say you're in AdWords and you're in Search and you're in Facebook and you're in Twitter and they can find you on LinkedIn and friend you too. Right? Suddenly, they have more ways to find you in a highly and a likelihood that they will find you those other ways. 
Educated prospects, by definition, convert better. Definition of educated. If you don't know how to buy a you know, digital SLR, you won't be able to, right? Or you'll be very unhappy and just you know, return it. So educating the buyers is very key. Uh, even better is indoctrinating them. So educate them. That's part of the deal. Give them the facts, and then steer them to the right decision-making process. Like, well. You know, is that SLR good enough for you? Because, you know, you might outgrow that in a couple of years. You really ought to just buy a little bit ahead just to be sure because the switching cost is pretty high in electronics. You know that. You see? Is that a fact? Well, yes. It's based on facts, but I've steered that person to a particular way of thinking about the purchase, which may not be the other, you know, not be the only way to do it. The other way is, hey, you know what? These things... They decline in cost so rapidly, and there's always the next better model in just a year anyway. If you try to buy ahead, you're just going to be disappointed. What you ought to do is go for the cheapest thing you can find right now, and then sell a damn thing on eBay when you're done and you want to upgrade. See? Now, which of those two businesses, you know, sorry, which of those two stories are you going to tell for your business? It depends on how you are positioning yourself. Uh, Finally, trust is the single biggest conversion factor, and one of, the one of the things that makes it so insidious is that people do not know when it's working. Right? They don't know when it's at work in their psyche. They don't really say, well, I don't know, I don't really trust this guy. No, it's when the page loads slow, the graphics look sloppy, things aren't aligned right, or there's grammar or spelling problems, and I, full disclosure, I, I just discovered that one of our sales letters has that too. You know, those things subliminally create distrust because you don't look like you got everything dialed in right. Okay? Trust is the single biggest conversion factor. Get that right. <laughs> so let's talk about the best markets to use content mar marketing now that we have some clue about what it actually does. The first category, and we'll go through these in turn, information-rich products. I'll define what that means in a moment. Anything where there's an involved decision or selection process, whether it's information or not, and then things with very high differentiation. So what's information rich? That means it has lots of damn features. For example, uh, I'm actually in the market for a, a replacement of some of my stuff in my studio, right? The one I'm sitting in right now. And I can't actually, I cannot even find the answer. That's how bad this is. I cannot find the answer to this one specific question despite the reams and reams and reams and reams of content out there on cameras. And this is about cameras, right? Cameras are information rich. Selecting a camera is... It's way harder than ordering breakfast, and that has a lot of options, as you well know. You know what kind of toast? Do you want butter and jelly? Phones, the other, the other area. It's like, how big a screen would you like? You can get them all the way up to football field size, right? Appliances, that's the other one. It's like, well, okay, do I need the two-and-a-half horsepower blender, <laughs> you know, or is a horse and three-quarters enough, right? And why? Well, it depends on what you're going to blend, sir, right? That's an information-rich product. Anything like that... Um, just in terms of writing like applications, you know, uh, blog posts. I mean, an essentially infinite amount of content that you can write about information-rich products. Now, this kind of can, can to some extent, overlap with uh, involved selection process, which would mean obviously if there's uh, lots of different choices, then that makes the selection process more involved. But there are other kinds of products where there's a selection process that's involved, not because of information content. I'll do the last one first, wedding rings. You know, okay, you know, how many carrots is it? You like white gold versus the yellow gold, right? We're not talking about the number of features like we have on, on, on phones and cameras. However, what's so involved about the selection process in wedding rings? It's a highly emotional, long-term sale. It's one of those things you've got to get two people to cry over. Right? Automobiles, well, it's yeah, they're information rich, but they're also, you got so many things wrapped up, particularly with middle-aged men. <laughs> about what automobile they have to have, right? Okay, because there's a lot more going on here than the information that's going on. You know, it's like if they're, you know, if it's single, if they pick up chicks, and if it's too old, it's about whether or not they're having a midlife crisis, and you know, it goes on and on. You know, you like the is 275 horsepower enough for you? You know, um, artwork. You know, it's I don't know what looks good, but I know what it when I see it. Uh, that's a selection process that is just, my God, it could take forever. One of our clients right now, is, you know, they, they sell very large pieces of art that hangs on the wall. Well, of course they have a long lead item. Another one I didn't list here, this one's really probably my favorite one, is clawfoot bathtubs. 
You know, it's not one of those things you just like pick one up at a garage sale and it will just surprise your wife with one. Hey, honey, look what I got. I cloth with bathtub. You're talking about a bathroom remodel. Well, of course it takes 90 to 120 days to figure that out. High differentiation. So this is any personal service. Medical, obviously, tops the list. You trust that doctor, yes or no. Well, go to maid. I mean, okay, you know, we actually went through several maids before finding one that's, you know, that we really like and kept. Um, most business services, and this is where we talk about in 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 consulting and in information marketing, um, in, in an extent, and you, you got to be careful of what what you take away from this, but it's that you do not have competitors. You know, in the sense that okay, so we do teaching. Frank Kern does teaching. Ryan Dice does teaching. Are we competing with each other? Well, only at the margins, you know. And in, the reality is, a lot of our customers are also customers of those two guys, right? And so you could say that when in the business and personal services, you're not being, in, in many respects, you're not being compared against somebody else. Except, of course, another important except is that there's a limited amount of budget, you know, to go around. And so someone may, you know, drop six grand on Frank's product and not be able to afford us, right? Bad choice. And so that's where in business and, and personal services, any kind of service business like that, there's very high differentiation because it's almost impossible to do a real A B comparison. This applies to everything of a custom nature. So custom motorcycle, right? That is very, very high differentiated. I mean, because you know, I like his designs and I don't like that other design, you know, that's gonna make the choice. And then almost all travel, unless it's just, uh, you know, I got to be in Orlando tomorrow for a business trip. You know, find the first flight, um, and I'm only stay at night, so who cares? Get me Motel Six. You know, that's that's the limited case. But if it's more like, well, let's see, which Latin American country would I like to go vacation in? You know, this is a very high differentiation, and the price is not really the primary. You know, criteria. I mean, it is a criteria, but again, you don't have a A B comparison. Like, well, Belize is nice, Costa Rica is nice. Yes, you have that, but then you start digging into which resorts and which travel, you know, firm or whatever. You're you're not doing exactly A B comparison, and that's where each one of those places has an opportunity to sway the conversation dramatically because of that high differentiation. Um, now, where content marketing is not a good fit, <laughs> it's a really funny story about this. We have time. Remind me to talk about doing PPC for plumbers. And so, transactional offers and things with low differentiation, more or less the opposite of the other three categories, right? So, what's transactional? That's, oh, uh, gee, the sink is backed up. Let's call somebody to fix it, right? You don't, you know, that's not one of the things you research, you know what I'm saying? You might research it for 10 minutes, but you're going to get that fixed. Um, I'm standing in downtown Atlanta, and I need to go home, and my car's broken. I'm going to hire a cab. Well, actually, I'd probably call Uber, actually, now I think about it. And so cabs, whatever's in the area, whoever can get here quick, same with tow trucks. These are transactional. It's not like content marketing is going to help a tow truck business. All right? Nobody is looking in advance for towing services, well, unless it's in a commercial but certainly in a B2C, that's not the case, right? What's low differentiation? Toilet paper. You know, God bless you if you have a toilet paper business because those are the people who make the most money or the ones who do big consumables. However, content marketing, you know, I don't even want to think about what that would look like for toilet paper, moving on rapidly. Nuts and bolts. The only person we ever turned away uh, from Link Liberation literally sold nuts and bolts and fasteners of all sorts wholesale <laughs> so not even retail. You know, we basically told them is to get out, uh, you know, get out the big books of everybody that buys that stuff and just call them individually. There's only a couple of thousand in the United States. Then something like electricity, other utilities. It's not like, and in some markets, yes, you can shop around for electric power, but like, how are you going to do that? And an electric power company is going to content marketing? Yeah, I'm not really seeing it, right? So. But be careful of whether you decide something is transactional or uh, non-differentiable. For example, is shaving a low differentiating pro differentiated product? Um, well, I would have thought so until the Dollar Shave Club. And I thought, okay, well, that's one. 
Actually, since then I've found two other, not one, but two other startups. One of them venture capital back. Actually, I think Shave Club is too. Now that I think about it. Where they're actually, and this one company is actually inventing new shaving products. Okay, that's nuts. So much for razors being low differentiation, right? Turns out it can be differentiated. All right, well, let's look at transactional. Is a DUI defense attorney trans a transactional uh, offer? Well, you might think so. It's like, okay, I just, I just got, I just got pulled over, and you know, I just got arrested, or whatever. I need a defense attorney. Well, yeah, but they're going to let you out on bail, and then you have a couple of days to figure out who to hire. And so, you know, it's certainly one of those things you're not planning in advance. I hope you're not planning in advance for your need for a DUI attorney, but you do have some amount of time to plan for it. Uh, it's not really quite like a plumber. And so, yes, is content going to help? Yes, indeed. I have a good friend, had exactly that experience, where sure enough, she had to, uh, you know, to find an attorney, and the one with the most content and the most videos that showed how to beat breathalyzers, okay, uh, is the one who won the case, right? Well, won the business. Now, what about business models? That's the other area where, you know, kind of the other dimension here. We just talked about products and markets, but what about the way you make money in that market? First one is affiliate marketing. You keep hearing about, oh, does this work for affiliate marketing? Yeah, it does. In fact, you know, when you boil it down, it's the only thing that works in affiliate marketing. If you don't have content and you're an affiliate, how are you value add? Right? And so let's let's take the ultimate case as an Amazon store. All right. So you set up a probably you set up a WordPress blog and buy one of the Gozillion Warrior Special Offer plugins in order to create a store out of your blog. And you put up product pictures that link directly to Amazon. Right. Where's value add? You basically just define, you just wrote the definition for thin affiliate site. Okay. So how do you how do you escape that? Well, you, you write content, you do reviews, you do you know product analysis, you do you know content about how to apply the product or what do those characteristics actually even mean? Right? Do you need a uh, one four thousandth of a second shutter on your camera? Those kind of things. That's what actually takes an affiliate, thin affiliate, and makes it a fat one. So, yes, does content marketing work? I would say beyond that, it's requirement. What about lead generation? Well, here too, uh, you know, ultimately lead generation is very simple. There's a form, and you're going to ask for a very limited amount of information, and they're going to click a button, or they're going to pick up a phone and, and call you, contact you. Well, that's great, but how do you lead them to that decision if not with content, right? The other thing is lead generation businesses are typically things like services where indeed they're highly differentiated. How do you communicate that differentiation if not with content? So again, I'd say kind of required. Online retail. This is where most people have this notion that because they have a store, they don't need a blog or they don't need anything on their blog except special offers, coupons, and sales. Uh, wrong again. And so the only thing wrong with having a store today is that it's just a store. And if you're just a store, you're just a um, undercapitalized Amazon. And, and good luck, by the way, beating Jeff Bezos at that game, right? And so, you know, and you don't have that big following that Amazon has. If you're just a store, what are you doing for differentiation? Well, you better use content. You better form a relationship in the wide part of the funnel, the top of the funnel, form that relationship, and then nurture that person by educating and indoctrinating them. Because if you do that, you're operating a place that Amazon cannot go because it doesn't scale to a bazillion products. Right? So in online retail, you don't have to do it. You can continue being just a store if you want to be, but just realize what you're doing. You're competing head to head with Amazon. Now, so I want you to consider this. It is not the product, and it, oh, sorry, it is it is the product and the market that make content marketing work, not the way that you make money in that market. That's the key, right? So you have to look at your product and market, and who buys that? Who's the prospects that you're trying to attract and get that product? You know, to get this, to buy that product. That's the important characterization of whether or not uh, content marketing is going to work or not. How you make money, 
That doesn't matter. That's not what content marketing is about. In fact, just the opposite. Content marketing is how you get people attracted to your offer. The offer itself can be any of those business models. Which kind of dovetails into thinking about content marketing the right way. This is a marathon, not a sprint. If you want to build a real business, something that's not some flash in the pan, you're going to have to build another one, you know, just like it next year in a different market. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Anybody can build a hundred thousand dollar business. I know for those of you who don't have hundred thousand dollar business yet, you probably kind of pissed at me for saying that. But the reality is a hundred thousand dollar business is not much of a trick to build. Now, building a sustainable one, you know, that's another story because that's a really tiny business. You don't really have much in the way of economies of scale to work with. Building a million dollar business is a lot more meaningful accomplishment, and that's where the fun actually begins. It's only at seven figures where it gets fun. Uh, everyone talks about building a six-figure business. Ho hum, who cares? That's not sustainable by itself. That's not even a good job. So this is a marathon, not a sprint. If you want to be successful, you got to plan for the long term. And think about the valuation of what you build, not the net profit. I mean, there is a reason that every venture-backed company on the planet loses money until basically IPOs. Why? Because they're buying ahead. They're building valuation, not net profit. They're buying market as fast as they can possibly buy it. It's the Amazon story. I mean, it's the reason that Jeff Bezos, you know, is a hero and not a clown is because that that scheme worked. He bought ahead fast enough that he reached economies of scale so that the system worked. Every business ultimately has that characteristic, and you probably can't go quite as crazy as, as Jeff did, but that's, it has the same nature. You have to prime the pump. And so think about what are you building in the way of like the valuation of your customer list in your, um, your conversion strategy, marketing strategies, you know, the, the, uh, the characteristics of your website that actually lead people to conversion. Those are things which are, have asset value. And they have asset value because they have long-term value, not just how much money did I make this month. Now, granted, you have to make money in order to, in order to get to the long term. Just realize that the real, the real play here has to be in the long term. And then finally, think service, not selling. Now, not for your entire business. Obviously, you have to sell. However, in order to make content marketing work, in order to be highly differentiated, in order to get ahead of Amazon, in order to, uh, to really build a sustainable business, you have to do value in advance. You have to touch the customer multiple times in the top of the funnel and get them to know, like, and trust you. And you do that by providing service. You provide value in advance without selling them. You wait to the end to sell them. Because once they trust you, they almost sell themselves. Not quite. I mean, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't do a layup on the order, you know, order form. Just make, make sure that you have everything, you know, best practices in place in order to actually close the sale. But just realize that if they get to the point where they already trust you, they've already, they're already pre-sold. They'll argue for the sale. I mean, I've had this happen where, no, 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 I don't know what to talk about it. I just, I just, I just want to, I just want to buy this. Oh, okay, settle down. I'll let you buy it. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the experience you want to have in your business. So, making a choice. You know, how do you go about making that choice? Nearly any business will benefit from content marketing. I hope we went through that. You know, with sufficient detail that you can see that. Anything where that's a less than easy decision process where it's an information rich product and I invite you to to try to stump us I mean we I don't see I know we did this in both LL2 and LL3 we may have done it at other times where we did a live call-in show where we asked people to to uh, give us examples of products or markets where they thought that that link liberation would not work and link liberation is you know the, the formula for the way we do content marketing um, and like I said, the only one that we were really stumped by is nuts and bolts wholesale. Right? Everything else we could find a way to do content for. So nearly any business will, will benefit from content marketing. Transactional offers and the true commodities like toilet paper are the exceptions. I doubt that you are in any of those unless, of course, you're trying to do PPC for plumbers. God bless you, Frank. Um, the challenge is how to make it happen, and so you're expecting this because I already told you what we do. We do content marketing first, and then we do a sale, and so you can either do this yourself or you can hire it done, and if you want to hire it done, I don't think there's any better way to get that done than to hire us. 
And so that, uh, that's the prepared presentation. What I'd like to do at this point is invite you to ask questions about, uh, about your market, about your product. You know, let us, let us have that open dialogue with, hey, how would we go about doing content marketing for your product or service? Because most people have this idea that their business is dramatically different than everybody else's. We have not found that to be the case. Um, that's just, you know, everybody is people. And a B2B or B2C, it doesn't matter. You're selling to a person, and that person has needs, wants, and desires that you can identify and attract them with content and attract them to your brand. Um, so let me go ahead and do the whole stop sharing thing. Yeah, there we go. Now let's see. So what what do we have in the way? Of, oh my heavens! Wow, we've got questions or comments over here. Something. Has anybody been following this? <laughs> Dan, Michelle? Not exactly. No. Okay. I, I have, but no. there's only really one Not question. Not really on the content so far. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's just slide. Oh, I see. It was about our technical difficulty. Terrible quality video keeps cutting out. Yeah, I mean, we can't do anything about the platform, guys. Um, okay. Uh, hmm. Yeah, some people were having serious problems with it. Uh, Today, which is, uh, is, is yeah, and it's interesting, you know, from my perspective, Leslie, I you're you were consistently clear, so I don't know what's going on with the broadcast platform. I know it's not it's not clearly not coming out of your end today. Yeah, right. Yeah, once I got my sound working at the beginning mm -hmm. of the show. Yeah. Um, okay. We wouldn't have let you keep talking if we couldn't hear you. Don't worry. Not a second time. Not, right. not this time. Yeah, not this time. Good. Glad to hear it. So, all right. Um, well, so Dan and Michelle, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I guess they completely stumped the audience, and so they didn't uh, didn't have any questions. But uh, do you have anything to, to add to that? And then let's talk about what we're doing next week because we're actually on schedule for a change. How about that? Yeah. Well, I think that I I, I think that um, you hit something on the nail on the head when you relate this back to real business that a lot of businesses think about when I'm consulting with clients and one of the one of the sessions that I've done with clients is we talk about where you are on this referral funnel and how you insert yourself further up the funnel. So if you're if you're in the wedding business, how do you get to know the people who are making decisions early on? So you need to be knowing the jeweler. If you're if you're a wedding planner, you probably need to know the jeweler or the florist and the people who, you know, who start who started at the beginning of that romance. And I think some of what you're saying is the same thing, creating this content this content so that you're definitely inserting yourself way ahead. So by the by the time someone gets around to actually buying that dishwasher, they're like you know, I just, I feel really good about calling these guys because, and, and I, I think that's something that a lot of businesses miss, but they actually already do it in real life. These small business owners do it in real life when they're at networking events or they're at functions or they're whatever. They're providing their expertise to customers verbally, but they always take the sort of the stance that why would I put that on my website? I'm going to put myself out of business. That doesn't sell my product. Yet it's the same content they give customers all the time who come in the store. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, it, it seems weird that the reaction there. I mean, um, even, as, even as content marketers, sorry, as information marketers, which we're not really that anymore, but, you know, we were always told and we always abided by the advice to give, get some of your best stuff away. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's how you, to a large extent, that's how you establish trust. If you're a, if teaching and training, is you have to provide that sort of result in advance. You have to show them. You know, they have to have an experience of what it's like to work with you. Um, so the, the greater extent you can have a, give the person the experience of having a relationship with you, um, you know, the better they're going to have that no lie and trust reaction when it comes time to give you money. So. Um, Let's see. Wow. Quincy, you can go ahead and type your question if you have it. Yeah, I, I asked him to do that. But Greg just says here, are there any custom dashboards for GA um, that help you identify content that is resonating with your viewers 
uh, not just looking at specific page views and time on site, but across multiple pages and subjects. Um, not exactly. Um, there are some things that we're trying to develop right now because this is a felt need in the market. For, well, felt need for us. Um, reporting tools are kind of a mess right now in, in this area. So, first of all, you can use something like Shared Count, which I recently discovered. Um, you have to load up all your URLs and then it'll give you back totals of where it was shared. I mean, and shares and likes and all that kind of stuff. So, in terms of the social sphere. If you go with, in, in Google Analytics, if you do uh, content groups, uh, then you can uh, you can roll do some reporting based upon groups of content. Um, so if you have you know, your blog is segregated, or if you have you know uh, different kinds of content within your blog that are, that are tagged as content groups, you can do it that way. But you have to think that through in advance. You can't do anything in arrears in, in Google Analytics, right? Um, and then, of course, there's the assisted conversions in, let's see, it's in conversions, multi-channel, something or other, assisted conversions. And you can find it it's down, all down near the bottom in the, uh, in the menus in the Google Analytics. Um, and assisted conversions is, is a great deal of help. And for that, the other, the other thing I like to do is go look at um, um, acquisition channels, or is that audience? So it's acquisition channels. And then use the advanced filter to turn off paid, right? So I'm looking at all non-paid traffic. Um, so those are a couple things you can do, but they're they're pretty rough right now. It's pretty rough. And, and I would say they're even. It's not. There's not. There's no beautiful science about it at all. One of the things when, when we were putting together sort of the preponderance of content, I leveraged. Um, Google Analytics and did the advanced search and so it happened that this particular client did a great job with page naming convention and so every page that was about let's just go with the dishwashers every page that was about blue dishwasher somewhere in the content they that was pretty much contained in the page name and so I could then do a search within Google Analytics on those different topics that I kind of know are clustering and take a look at what the activity was on those sets of pages. And that's probably just kind of similar to the content grouping, which I haven't tried. But, um, but I, I try to hack and, and slice and machete my way through all kind of stuff in Google Analytics. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Just, it's just a matter of if you're really diligent up front with how you're naming stuff, it's more helpful. But if you haven't been and it's just sort of, a cluster, then then it's a lot harder. If you do something like a, um, I remember back with Yahoo Stores when you would create a new product, and this was a, a trick that that a lot of people never got a hold of. If you would type in this long product name, it would just take out the vowels in every third letter and shrink it into this 17 character page name. And so we got really comfortable and care, careful about uploading them, so we had very clear page names um, for what things were. And and so it's just really some of that is just taking pre. Uh, Action up front. I can't think of proactive, being proactive about how you're naming stuff. That's one other way I think of. Right. No, that that uh, that, that makes sense. It, but like with Google Analytics, you have to plan in advance for how you're going to do that. Yeah. And even even with that, it's not it's it's not perfect. No. Uh, yeah, it's just, it just is what it is right now. And partially, it's not perfect because it can't be. It's not just that the tools are, are lacking. It's just that we don't really know. Uh, Okay, so let's let's say the person touched your site five times, and that last one was a purchase. Which one of those touches was the determining factor? Well, the last one, right? No, not necessarily. No. Um, and it could very well be that uh, a whole bunch of reasons why that could be, and they could have decided about the third touch, um, and then they had to go back, and then they got distracted, and they went back again, and then purchased. Right? That's a possibility. Right. So it happens all the time for us. Yep. Any so, of us. Yeah, um, or I see. Oh, let's see. That that uh, special offer expires Friday. I'm busy right now. I'll get around to it. So I decided that on Monday I was going to do it. Then I came back on Friday and I did it. So oh well, that means okay. This was the urgency that sold. Well, kind of. I and mean, that's because I did it. You know, I did it Friday instead of Saturday because I had to. But I made a decision on Monday. Right. So you don't know that. You, just, you don't know how it works. Um. Let's see. Quincy is. Ask a question here. How can a client of mine, a frozen food 
manufacturer of successful new content marketing, would it be better to focus on the end consumer who eats the food or on the store owner who sells it and how to find the type of content that would drive links in this boring market. Yeah, boring market. I wish I had paid every time someone called their market boring. Um, well, I could I respond to that, Dan, or you've been you can sit over there quietly in the darkness. Why don't you why don't you take this one? Uh, yeah. Um, so a couple things here. First of all, I'd want to understand a little bit more about what's the what's the differentiation in the product, right? I mean if it if you're literally selling um, you know this is exactly the same as everything else. Well um, do something to make it different. I mean add mercury. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, to, to you know, to create uh, some kind of a unique selling proposition, and and then that's really you know the question is, do you have a unique selling proposition that appeals to the consumer? That is, is it uh, you know GMO free, anti uh, free radical gluten seafood? Um, is it especially rich in omega nine or whatever? Um, is there some way that you can make it appealing to the consumer so that it's something that they're going to walk into a store and ask for? Um, and then they'll go, oh, well, we don't have that, right? And that's one of the um, coolest campaigns that I've seen is, is, is a coupon campaign <laughs> uh, that was uh, by a brand that absolutely did not believe that anybody would find their product in the stores, and they saturated an area, uh, and uh, all of those coupons being presented, do you have this, uh, is what uh, warmed them up before the sales reps started calling. Uh, but who 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 is going to care the most about what your differentiating factor is? If it's something that you know consumers demand this brand uh, or this feature and and it's available, that's great. If you can, uh, then you probably want to uh, you know think about uh, about more of a consumer focused content marketing strategy to build a brand. If it's just that uh, you know um, our slaves work twenty percent harder and so our fish is fifty percent cheaper. Uh, then you know, that's something that you'd want to focus on on the seller. So it kind of depends a little bit on on how you differentiate, how you position yourself in the market as to what side you'd start with. At least you'd probably want to focus on both if you're what I would call a normal uh, company at some point. But where do you start? Well, right, and that's yeah, that's the two different avatars there. So I mean, to some extent, you almost have a two-sided market if you're if you're trying to convince a wholesaler to put your product in the store uh, so the consumers will buy it. I mean, you have really two two marketing missions. Um, is that you really do have to get you do have to create demand for your product um, if it's if it's if its own brand, right? Um, but you also then have to convince the the store, the seller, um, that uh, that there's that there's a market for it. So how do you how do you do that? And so the, the two different avatars, you know, as Dan was pointing out, if you have a consumer focused campaign that shows why they should have this. Uh, that's really good, and that's going to be content centered around whatever, uh, whatever the needs, wants, and desires are relative to or connected with that kind of a product. And so let's let's say it's I don't know, it's frozen vegetables or whatever. And so you know why you should eat your vegetables, you know why why uh, how to do it, eat a real balanced diet, and why the food pyramid is obviously upside down, and, you know any of those kinds of you know, memes as a consumer focused message in order to get them to want more vegetables. Um, and if there's particular something you know, like including you know, mer mercury is good for you, right? Start a campaign around that. Um, the uh, on the store side, uh, you know why yours? They already have frozen food. They already have frozen vegetables. So why yours is better, different, or whatever? That's your selling message. But now, how do you attract them to your brand? How do you attract the store owner to your brand um, so that you can then sell them frozen food? And that's about, again, writing about the needs, wants, and desires of your target, in this case, the store owner. So what are the problems that a store owner faces? Uh, maybe it's about the delivery time. Maybe it's about losses. Maybe it's about uh, the, the markup that's available in frozen food. Maybe any number of those things. You'd have to, that's something that I don't, certainly don't know. Uh, but your customers do. Your, the, those people selling your product right now do. And I bet that you know that stuff, too. It's a reason it's with, you know, every one of our clients, we bring them in on content marketing. We do the avatar call with them, and we're going to ask that our client what their clients, you know, um, are actually interested in, what they do, what does a day in the life of your client look like, and uh, you probably already know that. You know, if you don't know that, you need to know that because it has to shape all of your marketing. Um, 
Let's see, Terry says a related question to Quincy's is if you set your content target at, at the consumers of the frozen food and the results as expected increase sales through the stores, how do you quantify the results from the content marketing effort? You can't. That's the problem. Uh, content marketing is one of those things that's very difficult to actually quantify in real terms, particularly when you have a, if you're, you know, you got somebody in between, right? Um, so if you're wholesaling, uh, if that's, you know, here's, here's, if it's not an online transaction or you can track the, track the money event, it gets tough. You know, we have clients that are, that are lead gen and almost all of their, their leads come in on the phone. And some of them are not doing a very good job of tracking phone calls. And so, you know, was this effective or wasn't it? Really hard to say. And so, um, it, it is what it is. I mean, online, we expect everything to be tracked. We have this culture that says we should be able to track everything. We're just weird. I mean, you know, before online, nobody, nobody had any notion you could track marketing. Hold on there, pal. Well, direct mail. Those of us that mailed millions of letters out. Yes. And spam people's fax machines briefly. Yes, that was that was like that was okay one right, but you you couldn't track any kind of advertising. Um, so yeah, I mean it's the the areas of marketing that we can or could track have been historically small in number to start with, and frankly are getting smaller, not larger. Um, because the transaction well, we used to have almost market. perfect tracking on SEO. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Google. Not provided none of your business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we know the content program increased recognition of the product, but how do we convince the frozen food client of the results? And that's from Terry again. Um, and like I said, it's 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 very difficult to do so. Um, the the things that you can grab onto as leading indicators, okay? So if you do not have an online conversion event, the only thing you have to work with are going to be uh, things like growth in, tra growth in traffic, you know, growth in social signals, and, um, and then whatever your bottom line number is, which, of course, you're not going to tie to content marketing per se, but you're going to tie to the overall uh, set of marketing strategy you have run. Oh, by the way, though, I mean, uh, you know, this is not a, a sales job that gets solved with math, right? If I'm if I'm going to a, a chain of stores and saying, "Hey, I want you to carry my product," um, I don't need to prove to them with math that what I do need to do is convince them that um, that there's actually something going on. Show them what I'm doing to build demand, and that, you know, uh, telling them what my plan is. If they put it in the stores, and we'll mail out coupons, and here's how we're gonna um, you know make this thing a success for you. You're already way ahead of a lot of other brands in that context, in that you're actually trying to do something besides saying, "Hey, grocery store, figure out how to sell my stuff." Buy my stuff, yeah. Um, and it, and it's you know if we if we go to a little bit simpler example, right? Because most people do not have the situation that Quincy is referring to. Uh, most people are not don't, don't have any some you know a party in between there where they remove where a they have two avatars they have to address, two different entirely different needs. They have to talk to. Um, most of us are going to have multiple avatars, but they're related. You know, so I've got the, you know, the very small business professional. I've got a little bit larger business professional as my avatars. Okay, their their needs overlap more than they don't. Um, but I, what I, you know, if I'm trying to actually sell through an agency to sell to clients, ah, now that's different. Right, that's a different problem. It's much like what, what Quincy asked me. For the rest of you, it's more likely than not that you don't have that two stage thing. So now the question is, what can you track and what can you attribute? Uh, and the attribution problem is, is, is not perfect, but assisted conversions is a really, really, really good step in the right direction. Um, so, and in, across the board, what we find is about 30% of all conversions are assisted. Uh, so, you know, that, that's got to tell you something about the, uh, well, two things. One is, that's bound to be low. Um, because of a lack of, of attribution because they cross well, the Well, some of these guys the that we have of, you know, long sales processes with, with their products, I mean, we can tell right. that 90% of the conversions that we measure uh, had more than one touch in. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. 
Sending so, an email might be a remarketing ad, or it might be a lot of things, but um, you know, we stay in their face as long as it's plausible to do so. Yeah, and what we were just talking to a client this morning, and one of the things was, was I forget what the you know with the the top performing pay per click you know for their the ad for their for their campaign was their branded was their name, and somebody somehow knew their name. You know, so their their last their first and last touch was to type in their domain name and make a sale, or make a purchase rather. Really. You know, who, who told them to type in that domain name? It's obviously pretty suspicious, you know, that there, there had to have been some other interaction, there had to have been some other touch. In There's a lot of people just know the domain name. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> they, just, they put their monkeys on it, they Direct said, go find me a domain. Just completely mm -hmm. random. Yeah, just completely random. Someone typing in the traffic. Yeah. Absolutely. And then well, buying stuff randomly. And I wanted to add to, to, you know, and part of what we do when we're, we're working on content management too, is right. It was we're 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 echoing and amplifying um, through Facebook, and so I would be hard pressed to believe that they couldn't continue to leverage that additional part of it if they're trying to reach brand recognition, um, because there's this amazing thing. Many of these large chains now have this thing called a Facebook page, and in some instances, have a large enough audience that you can actually target content to those pages. And to the likers of those pages, and so um, for his case, I, I think there's a huge opportunity to create visibility by by using the cycles that we you've talked about for the last few weeks, and just really leveraging that. I mean, your end consumers love recipes, but 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 getting that brand name associated with the people who already like the store, ooh, there's an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think that that's all the questions we have for uh, for today. And uh, let's see. You know, I did not get with you guys in advance because we had some issues with audio in advance of this webinar. So, um, let's see, Dan. I believe that you had some actual case studies um, that was actually taken from the UTE crowd. Was it? You know, was it not the case? In terms of you're kind of on the edges of content marketing, you know, focus specifically on Facebook, correct? Dan's muted. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you for that, that expansive answer. Um, so, well, how you... I mean, these things really fit together. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, what we're tending to do with UTE is there's, you know, it's more of a hard edge on it to a sense, and we don't, in that course, really think about the long-term objective of building an audience. What we're after is we we've got a group of people. It's a small group of people. We're going to target them and try and figure out how to sell them stuff. And so uh, you you tend to see a series of you know, typically one to three, closer to three most of the time, content type stories that sort of bring people um, you know, closer into orbit. And then we have what we call qualifying content, which means that um, uh, you know, if, uh, how much money could you save if you refinanced your mortgage right now? Well, that's all pure content, right? It's how to figure out that and okay, so it's pure content, but who clicks on that? People that have a mortgage, um, and are thinking that they might be able to save some money by refinancing it. And so once they've clicked to that content, then I can put them into a direct response funnel where I can push them back to go use the uh, mortgage refinancing calculator thing that I had, right, which lands on a, hey, would you like to submit this for a quote form? <laughs> um, and, you know, for, for stuff like that, it's it's content with uh, more, of, more of a launch type focus than, than anything else. And the same thing, no, no matter what your differentiation is, um, doing a little bit of co content, even if it's third party content that, that gets people to think that you know, that's important, right? So if you're going to sell them gluten-free squid, um, then you know, a, few, uh, a couple of articles that you, you know, don't have to put a whole lot of money into, into promoting that, that are more along the lines of gluten is bad and um, you know, a lot of Chinese squid have gluten in them because they secretly inject it to poison us. Um, and then we start selling gluten-free squid. Um, the same thing, you know, when we're going to do ads for our, you know, AdWords management service, what do we do? Well, it's, you know, we do some light content on, hey, how's your AdWords account per account performing? Uh, you know, what what is your ROI target? What's your cost per action that you want? Uh, you know, depending on the type of business. 
And how are you doing relative to that? Okay, well, if you're not doing well, perhaps at that point, you might want to um, pick up the phone and get some help with that. But it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's more to help us identify people um, as more likely to be prospects rather and, and to focus more marketing resources on those that are following along with the content rather than to just try and build up an audience. Right, and that's something we didn't really talk in a lot of the details of this about, you know, engagement and uh, you know, commitment and consistency and how yeah, and well, and well, we the two kind of start to fit together for us with our content marketing services. We're working on now on how to get um, a, a weekly email newsletter to kind of fall out of the content marketing that we're doing. But uh, if you think if you're doing content marketing, wrapping all that stuff into an email or uh, potentially multiple emails and using that content again for email, well. When you're going to email on something, you might as well advertise that to the same people on Facebook, what we call amplification. And, uh, you know, oh, by the way, that is going to increase the response to your Facebook campaign and it's going to increase the response to your email campaign. And so, uh, you know, what, you, what effort and, and money that you put into those two things, uh, you know, synergy is one of those words that idiots put on their resume when they don't know what it means, but it does actually mean something, and that's what we're talking about here. Right. So, uh, so next week, uh, Dan, you're going to present a few case studies about, around that. I would love to do that. All right. Then, then let's like do that. Um, so, uh, great. So that'll be next next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Same time, same back channel, and uh, Dan will be bringing you some real case studies. How to do ruthless content marketing for money. Content marketing for money. I love it. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody for playing along. Sorry for the late start. We had some, uh, you know, yet again technical problem with the platform. It was just, you know, for some reason, uh, audio wasn't working. Had to restart. And uh, and then of course, power uh, um, PowerPoint two weeks in a row uh, actually crashed. So, but the third uh, week you'll just show yeah. up with a PDF and you won't crash PowerPoint. Exactly right. Yeah, PDF it is for a little while until I debug that. So that's a new a new feature. All right. So anyway, thanks everybody for playing along, and we'll see you next week um, and talk about week. some specific case studies. Specific case studies. Indeed, that's true. The South Pacific. <laughs>